Chapter 12 Hydraulic and Pneumatic Power Systems Aircraft Hydraulic Systems The word hydraulics is based on the Greek word for water and originally meant the study of the physical behavior of water at rest and in motion. Today, the meaning has been expanded to include the physical behavior of all liquids, including hydraulic fluid. Hydraulic systems are not new to aviation. Early aircraft had hydraulic brake systems. As aircraft became more sophisticated, newer systems with hydraulic power were developed. Hydraulic systems in aircraft provide a means for the operation of aircraft components. The operation of landing gear, flaps, flight control surfaces, and brakes is largely accomplished with hydraulic power systems. Hydraulic system complexity varies from small aircraft that require fluid only for manual operation of the wheel brakes to large transport aircraft where the systems are large and complex. To achieve the necessary redundancy and reliability, the system may consist of several subsystems. Each subsystem has a power generating device, pump, reservoir, accumulator, heat exchanger, filtering system, etc. System operating pressure may vary from a couple hundred pounds per inch to, psi, in small aircraft and rotorcraft to 5,000 pounds per square inch in large transports. Hydraulic systems have many advantages as power sources for operating various aircraft units, they combine the advantages of lightweight, ease of installation, simplification of inspection, and minimum maintenance requirements. Hydraulic operations are also almost 100% efficient, with only negligible loss due to fluid friction. Hydraulic fluid hydraulic system liquids are used primarily to transmit and distribute forces to various units to be actuated. Liquids are able to do this because they are almost incompressible. Pascal's law states that pressure applied to any part of a confined liquid is transmitted with undiminished intensity to every other part. Thus, if a number of passages exist in a system, pressure can be distributed through all of them by means of the liquid. Manufacturers of hydraulic devices usually specify the type of liquid best suited for use with their equipment in view of the working conditions, the service required, temperatures expected inside and outside the systems, pressures the liquid must withstand, the possibilities of corrosion, and other conditions that must be considered. If incompressibility and fluidity were the only qualities required, any liquid that is not too thick could be used in a hydraulic system. But a satisfactory liquid for a particular installation must possess a number of other properties. Some of the properties and characteristics that must be considered when selecting a satisfactory liquid for a particular system are discussed in the following paragraphs. Viscosity One of the most important properties of any hydraulic fluid is its viscosity. Viscosity is internal resistance to flow. A liquid such as gasoline that has a low viscosity flows easily, while a liquid such as tar that has a high viscosity flows slowly. Viscosity increases as temperature decreases. A satisfactory liquid for a given hydraulic system must have enough body to give a good seal at pumps, valves, and pistons, but it must not be so thick that it offers resistance to flow, leading to power loss and higher operating temperatures. These factors add to the load and to excessive wear of parts. A fluid that is too thin also leads to rapid wear of moving parts or of parts that have heavy loads. The instruments used to measure the viscosity of a liquid are known as viscometers or viscosimeters. Several types of viscometers are in use today. The Sabolt viscometer measures the time required, in seconds, for 60 milliliters of the tested fluid at 100 degrees Fahrenheit to pass through a standard orifice. The time measured is used to express the fluid's viscosity, in Sabolt universal seconds or Sabolt furol seconds. Figure 12 1, Chemical Stability Chemical stability is another property that is exceedingly important in selecting a hydraulic liquid. It is the liquid's ability to resist oxidation and deterioration for long periods. All liquids tend to undergo unfavorable chemical changes under severe operating conditions. This is the case, for example, when a system operates for a considerable period of time at high temperatures. Excessive temperatures have a great effect on the life of a liquid. It should be noted that the temperature of the liquid in the reservoir of an operating hydraulic system does not always represent a true state of operating conditions. Localized hot spots occur on bearings, gear teeth, or at the point where liquid under pressure is forced through a small orifice. Continuous passage of a liquid through these points may produce local temperatures high enough to carbonize or sludge the liquid, yet the liquid in the reservoir may not indicate an excessively high temperature. Liquids with a high viscosity have a greater resistance to heat than light or low viscosity liquids that have been derived from the same source. The average hydraulic liquid has a low viscosity. Fortunately, there is a wide choice of liquids available for use within the viscosity range required of hydraulic liquids. 
Liquids may break down if exposed to air, water, salt, or other impurities, especially if they are in constant motion or subject to heat. Some metals, such as zinc, lead, brass, and copper, have an undesirable chemical reaction on certain liquids. These chemical processes result in the formation of sludge, gums, and carbon or other deposits that clog openings, cause valves and pistons to stick or leak, and give poor lubrication to moving parts. As soon as small amounts of sludge or other deposits are formed, the rate of formation generally increases more rapidly. As they are formed, certain changes in the physical and chemical properties of the liquid take place. The liquid usually becomes darker in color, higher in viscosity, and acids are formed. Flashpoint Flashpoint is the temperature at which a liquid gives off vapor in sufficient quantity to ignite momentarily or flash when a flame is applied. A high flash point is desirable for hydraulic liquids because it indicates good resistance to combustion and a low degree of evaporation at normal temperatures. Firepoint Firepoint is the temperature at which a substance gives off vapor in sufficient quantity to ignite and continue to burn when exposed to a spark or flame. Like flashpoint, a high fire point is required of desirable hydraulic liquids. Types of hydraulic fluids to assure proper system operation and to avoid damage to non-metallic components of the hydraulic system, the correct fluid must be used. When adding fluid to a system, use the type specified in the aircraft manufacturer's maintenance manual or on the instruction plate affixed to the reservoir or unit being serviced. The three principal categories of hydraulic fluids are, 1. Minerals 2. Polyalfalfins 3. Phosphate esters when servicing a hydraulic system the technician must be certain to use the correct category of replacement fluid. Hydraulic fluids are not necessarily compatible. For example, contamination of the fire-resistant fluid mill H83282 with mill H5606 may render the mill H83282 non-fire resistant. Mineral-based fluids Mineral oil-based hydraulic fluid, mill H5606, is the oldest, dating back to the 1940s. It is used in many systems, especially where the fire hazard is comparatively low. Mill H6083 is simply a rust inhibited version of Mill H5606. They are completely interchangeable. Suppliers generally ship hydraulic components with Mill H6083. Mineral based hydraulic fluid, Mill H5606, is processed from petroleum. It has an odor similar to penetrating oil and is dyed red. Some synthetic hydraulic fluids are dyed purple and even green, depending on the identity of the fluid. Synthetic rubber seals are used with petroleum-based fluids. Polyalpholfin-based fluids Mill H83282 is a fire-resistant hydrogenated polyalpholfin-based fluid developed in the 1960s to overcome the flammability characteristics of Mill H5606. Mill H83282 is significantly more flame-resistant than Mill H5606 but a disadvantage is the high viscosity at low temperature. It is generally limited to minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit. However, it can be used in the same system and with the same seals, gaskets, and hoses as mill H5606. Mill H46170 is the rust-inhibited version of mill H83282. Small aircraft predominantly use mill H5606, but some have switched to mill H83282 if they can accommodate the high viscosity at low temperature. Phosphate ester-based fluid These fluids are used in most commercial transport category aircraft and are extremely fire-resistant. However, they are not fireproof and under certain conditions, they burn. In addition, these fluids are very susceptible to contamination from water in the atmosphere. The earliest generation of these fluids was developed after World War II as a result of the growing number of aircraft hydraulic brake fires that drew the collective concern of the commercial aviation industry. Progressive development of these fluids occurred as a result of performance requirements of newer aircraft designs. The airframe manufacturers dubbed these new generations of hydraulic fluid, such as Skydrill and Hijet, as types based on their performance. Today, types 4 and 5 fluids are used. Two distinct classes of type 4 fluids exist based on their density, class I fluids are low density and class II fluids are standard density. The class I fluids provide weight savings advantages versus class II. In addition to the type 4 fluids that are currently in use, type V fluids are being developed in response to industry demands for a more thermally stable fluid at higher operating temperatures. Type V fluids will be more resistant to hydrolytic and oxidative degradation at high temperature than the type 4 fluids. 
Intermixing of fluids due to the difference in composition, petroleum-based and phosphate ester-based fluids will not mix, neither are the seals for any one fluid usable with or tolerant of any of the other fluids. Should an aircraft hydraulic system be serviced with the wrong type fluid, immediately drain and flush the system and maintain the seals according to the manufacturer's specifications. Compatibility with aircraft materials Aircraft hydraulic systems designed around phosphate ester-based fluids should be virtually trouble-free if properly serviced. Phosphate ester-based fluids do not appreciably affect common aircraft metals, aluminum, silver, zinc, magnesium, cadmium, iron, stainless steel, bronze, chromium, and others, as long as the fluids are kept free of contamination. Thermoplastic resins, including vinyl compositions, nitrocellulose lacquers, oil-based paints, linoleum, and asphalt may be softened chemically due to phosphate ester-based fluids. However, this chemical action usually requires longer than just momentary exposure, and spills that are wiped up with soap and water do not harm most of these materials. Paints that are resistant to phosphate ester-based fluids include epoxies and polyurethanes. Today, polyurethanes are the standard of the aircraft industry because of their ability to keep a bright, shiny finish for long periods of time and for the ease with which they can be removed. Hydraulic systems require the use of special accessories that are compatible with the hydraulic fluid. Appropriate seals, gaskets, and hoses must be specifically designated for the type of fluid in use. Care must be taken to ensure that the components installed in the system are compatible with the fluid. When gaskets, seals, and hoses are replaced, positive identification should be made to ensure that they are made of the appropriate material. Phosphate ester-based type V fluid is, compatible with natural fibers and with a number of synthetics, including nylon and polyester, which are used extensively in most aircraft. Petroleum oil hydraulic system seals of neoprene or buna and are not compatible with phosphate ester-based fluids and must be replaced with seals of butyl rubber or ethylene propylene elastomers. Hydraulic fluid contamination experience has shown that trouble in a hydraulic system is inevitable whenever the liquid is allowed to become contaminated. The nature of the trouble, whether a simple malfunction or the complete destruction of a component, depends to some extent on the type of contaminant. Two general contaminants are abrasives, including such particles as coarse sand, weld spatter, machining chips, and rust. Non-abrasives, including those resulting from oil oxidation and soft particles worn or shredded from seals and other organic components. Contamination check, whenever it is suspected that a hydraulic system has become contaminated or the system has been operated at temperatures in excess of the specified maximum, a check of the system should be made. The filters in most hydraulic systems are designed to remove most foreign particles that are visible to the naked eye. Hydraulic liquid that appears clean to the naked eye may be contaminated to the point that it is unfit for use. Thus, visual inspection of the hydraulic liquid does not determine the total amount of contamination in the system. Large particles of impurities in the hydraulic system are indications that one or more components are being subjected to excessive wear. Isolating the defective component requires a systematic process of elimination. Fluid returned to the reservoir may contain impurities from any part of the system. To determine which component is defective, liquid samples should be taken from the reservoir and various other locations in the system. Samples should be taken in accordance with the applicable manufacturer's instructions for a particular hydraulic system. Some hydraulic systems are equipped with permanently installed bleed valves for taking liquid samples, whereas on other systems, lines must be disconnected to provide a place to take a sample. Hydraulic sampling schedule, routine sampling, each system should be sampled at least once a year, or every 3,000 flight hours, or whenever the airframe manufacturer suggests. Unscheduled maintenance, when malfunctions may have a fluid-related cause, samples should be taken. Suspicion of contamination, if contamination is suspected, fluids should be drained and replaced, with samples taken before and after the maintenance procedure. Sampling procedure pressurize and operate hydraulic system for 10 to 15 minutes. During this period, operate various flight controls to activate valves and thoroughly mix hydraulic fluid. Shut down and depressurize the system. Before taking samples, always be sure to wear the proper personal protective equipment that should include, at the minimum, safety glasses and gloves. Wipe off sampling port or tube with a lint-free cloth. Do not use shop towels or paper products that could produce lint. Generally speaking, the human eye can see particles down to about 40 microns in size. Since we are concerned with particles down to 5 microns in size, it is easy to contaminate a sample without ever knowing it. 
Place a waste container under the reservoir drain valve and open valve so that a steady, but not forceful stream is running. Allow approximately 1 pint, 250 milliliters, of fluid to drain. This purges any settled particles from the sampling port. Insert a pre-cleaned sample bottle under the fluid stream and fill leaving an airspace at the top. Withdraw the bottle and cap immediately. Close drain valve. Fill out sample identification label supplied in sample kit, making sure to include customer name, aircraft type, aircraft tail number, hydraulic system sampled, and date sampled. Indicate on the sample label under remarks if this is a routine sample or if it is being taken due to a suspected problem. Service system reservoirs to replace the fluid that was removed. Submit samples for analysis to laboratory. Contamination control filters provide adequate control of the contamination problem during all normal hydraulic system operations. Control of the size and amount of contamination entering the system from any other source is the responsibility of the people who service and maintain the equipment. Therefore, precautions should be taken to minimize contamination during maintenance, repair, and service operations. If the system becomes contaminated, the filter element should be removed and cleaned or replaced. As an aid in controlling contamination, the following maintenance and servicing procedures should be followed at all times. Maintain all tools in the work area, workbenches and test equipment in a clean, dirt-free condition. A suitable container should always be provided to receive the hydraulic liquid that is spilled during component removal or disassembly procedures. Before disconnecting hydraulic lines or fittings, clean the affected area with dry cleaning solvent. All hydraulic lines and fittings should be capped or plugged immediately after disconnecting. Before assembly of any hydraulic components, wash all parts in an approved dry cleaning solvent, i.e., stoddard solvent. After cleaning the parts in the dry cleaning solution, dry the parts thoroughly and lubricate them with the recommended preservative or hydraulic liquid before assembly. Use only clean, lint-free cloths to wipe or dry the component parts. All seals and gaskets should be replaced during the reassembly procedure. Use only those seals and gaskets recommended by the manufacturer. All parts should be connected with care to avoid stripping metal slivers from threaded areas. All fittings and lines should be installed and torqued in accordance with applicable technical instructions. All hydraulic servicing equipment should be kept clean and in good operating condition. Contamination, both particulate and chemical, is detrimental to the performance and life of components in the aircraft hydraulic system. Contamination enters the system through normal wear of components, by ingestion through external seals during servicing, or maintenance, when the system is open to replace slash repair components, etc. To control the particulate contamination in the system, filters are installed in the pressure line, in the return line, and in the pump case drain line of each system. The filter rating is given in microns as an indication of the smallest particle size that is filtered out. The replacement interval of these filters is established by the manufacturer and is included in the maintenance manual. In the absence of specific replacement instructions, a recommended service life of the filter elements is pressure filters, 3,000 hours, return filters, 1,500 hours, case drain filters, 600 hours hydraulic system flushing when inspection of hydraulic filters or hydraulic fluid evaluation indicates that the fluid is contaminated, flushing the system may be necessary. This must be done according to the manufacturer's instructions. However, a typical procedure for flushing is as follows. 1. Connect a ground hydraulic test stand to the inlet and outlet test ports of the system. Verify that the ground unit fluid is clean and contains the same fluid as the aircraft. 2. Change the system filters. 3. Pump clean, filtered fluid through the system, and operate all subsystems until no obvious signs of contamination are found during inspection of the filters. Dispose of contaminated fluid and filter. Note, a visual inspection of hydraulic filters is not always effective. 4. Disconnect the test stand and cap the ports. 5. Ensure that the reservoir is filled to the full line or proper service level. It is very important to check if the fluid in the hydraulic test stand, or mule, is clean before the flushing operation starts. A contaminated hydraulic test stand can quickly contaminate other aircraft if used for ground maintenance operations. Health and handling Some phosphate ester-based fluids are blended with performance additives. Phosphate esters are good solvents and dissolve away some of the fatty materials of the skin. Repeated or prolonged exposure may cause drying of the skin, which if unattended, could result in complications, such as dermatitis or even secondary infection from bacteria. 
Phosphate ester-based fluids could cause itching of the skin but have not been known to cause allergic type skin rashes. Always use the proper gloves and eye protection when handling any type of hydraulic fluid. When phosphate ester-based mist or vapor exposure is possible, a respirator capable of removing organic vapors and mist must be worn. Ingestion of any hydraulic fluid should be avoided. Although small amounts do not appear to be highly hazardous, any significant amount should be tested in accordance with manufacturer's direction, followed with hospital-supervised stomach treatment. Basic hydraulic systems regardless of its function and design, every hydraulic system has a minimum number of basic components in addition to a means through which the fluid is transmitted. A basic system consists of a pump, reservoir, directional valve, check valve, pressure relief valve, selector valve, actuator, and filter. Figure 12-2, open center hydraulic systems An open center system is one having fluid flow, but no pressure in the system when the actuating mechanisms are idle. The pump circulates the fluid from the reservoir, through the selector valves, and back to the reservoir. Figure 12-3, the open center system may employ any number of subsystems, with a selector valve for each subsystem. Unlike the closed center system, the selector valves of the open center system are always connected in series with each other. In this arrangement, the system pressure line goes through each selector valve. Fluid is always allowed free passage through each selector valve and back to the reservoir until one of the selector valves is positioned to operate a mechanism. When one of the selector valves is positioned to operate an actuating device, fluid is directed from the pump through one of the working lines to the actuator. Figure 12-3b, with the selector valve in this position, the flow of fluid through the valve to the reservoir is blocked. The pressure builds up in the system to overcome the resistance and moves the piston of the actuating cylinder. Fluid from the opposite end of the actuator returns to the selector valve and flows back to the reservoir. Operation of the system following actuation of the component depends on the type of selector valve being used. Several types of selector valves are used in conjunction with the open center system. One type is both manually engaged and manually disengaged. First, the valve is manually moved to an operating position. Then, the actuating mechanism reaches the end of its operating cycle, and the pump output continues until the system relief valve relieves the pressure. The relief valve unseats and allows the fluid to flow back to the reservoir. The system pressure remains at the relief valve set pressure until the selector valve is manually returned to the neutral position. This action reopens the open center flow and allows the system pressure to drop to line resistance pressure. The manually engaged and pressure disengaged type of selector valve is similar to the valve previously discussed. When the actuating mechanism reaches the end of its cycle, the pressure continues to rise to a predetermined pressure. The valve automatically returns to the neutral position and to open center flow. Closed center hydraulic systems in the closed center system, the fluid is under pressure whenever the power pump is operating. The three actuators are arranged in parallel and actuating units B and C are operating at the same time while actuating unit A is not operating. This system differs from the open center system in that the selector or directional control valves are arranged in parallel and not in series. The means of controlling pump pressure varies in the closed center system. If a constant delivery pump is used, the system pressure is regulated by a pressure regulator. A relief valve acts as a backup safety device in case the regulator fails. If a variable displacement pump is used, System pressure is controlled by the pump's integral pressure mechanism compensator. The compensator automatically varies the volume output. When pressure approaches normal system pressure, the compensator begins to reduce the flow output of the pump. The pump is fully compensated, near zero flow, when normal system pressure is attained. When the pump is in this fully compensated condition, its internal bypass mechanism provides fluid circulation through the pump for cooling and lubrication. A relief valve is installed in the system as a safety backup. Figure 12-4, an advantage of the open center system over the closed center system is that the continuous pressurization of the system is eliminated. Since the pressure is built up gradually after the selector valve is moved to an operating position, there is very little shock from pressure surges. This action provides a smoother operation of the actuating mechanisms. The operation is slower than the closed center system, in which the pressure is available the moment the selector valve is positioned. Since most aircraft applications require instantaneous operation, closed center systems are the most widely used. Hydraulic power systems evolution of hydraulic systems Smaller aircraft have relatively low flight control surface loads, and the pilot can operate the flight controls by hand. Hydraulic systems were utilized for brake systems on early aircraft. 
When aircraft started to fly faster and got larger in size, the pilot was not able to move the control surfaces by hand anymore, and hydraulic power boost systems were introduced. Power boost systems assist the pilot in overcoming high control forces, but the pilot still actuates the flight controls by cable or push rod. Many modern aircraft use a power supply system and fly by wire flight control. The pilot input is electronically sent to the flight control servos. Cables or push rods are not used. Small power packs are the latest evolution of the hydraulic system. They reduce weight by eliminating hydraulic lines and large quantities of hydraulic fluid. Some manufacturers are reducing hydraulic systems in their aircraft in favor of electrically controlled systems. The Boeing 787 is the first aircraft designed with more electrical systems than hydraulic systems. Hydraulic power pack system A hydraulic power pack is a small unit that consists of an electric pump, filters, reservoir, valves, and pressure relief valve. Figure 12-5, the advantage of the power pack is that there is no need for a centralized hydraulic power supply system and long stretches of hydraulic lines, which reduces weight. Power packs could be driven by either an engine gearbox or electric motor. Integration of essential valves, filters, sensors, and transducers reduces system weight, virtually eliminates any opportunity for external leakage, and simplifies troubleshooting. Some power pack systems have an integrated actuator. These systems are used to control the stabilizer trim, landing gear, or flight control surfaces directly, thus eliminating the need for a centralized hydraulic system. Hydraulic system components figure 12-6 is a typical example of a hydraulic system in a large commercial aircraft. The following sections discuss the components of such system in more detail. Reservoirs The reservoir is a tank in which an adequate supply of fluid for the system is stored. Fluid flows from the reservoir to the pump, where it is forced through the system and eventually returned to the reservoir. The reservoir not only supplies the operating needs of the system, but it also replenishes fluid loss through leakage. Furthermore, the reservoir serves as an overflow basin for excess fluid forced out of the system by thermal expansion, the increase of fluid volume caused by temperature changes, the accumulators, and by piston and rod displacement. The reservoir also furnishes a place for the fluid to purge itself of air bubbles that may enter the system. Foreign matter picked up in the system may also be separated from the fluid in the reservoir or as it flows through line filters. Reservoirs are either pressurized or non-pressurized. Baffles and or fins are incorporated in most reservoirs to keep the fluid within the reservoir from having random movement, such as vortexing, swirling, and surging. These conditions can cause fluid to foam and air to enter the pump along with the fluid. Many reservoirs incorporate strainers in the filler neck to prevent the entry of foreign matter during servicing. These strainers are made of fine mesh screening and are usually referred to as finger strainers because of their shape. Finger strainers should never be removed or punctured as a means of speeding up the pouring of fluid into the reservoir. Reservoirs could have an internal trap to make sure fluid goes to the pumps during negative G conditions. Most aircraft have emergency hydraulic systems that take over if main systems fail. In many such systems, the pumps of both systems obtain fluid from a single reservoir. Under such circumstances, a supply of fluid for the emergency pump is ensured by drawing the hydraulic fluid from the bottom of the reservoir. The main system draws its fluid through a standpipe located at a higher level. With this arrangement, should the main system's fluid supply become depleted, adequate fluid is left for operation of the emergency system. Figure 12-7 illustrates that the engine-driven pump, EDP, is not able to draw fluid anymore if the reservoir gets depleted below the standpipe. The alternating current motor-driven pump, ACMP, still has a supply of fluid for emergency operations. Non-pressurized reservoirs Non-pressurized reservoirs are used in aircraft that are not designed for violent maneuvers, do not fly at high altitudes, or in which the reservoir is located in the pressurized area of the aircraft. High altitude in this situation means an altitude where atmospheric pressure is inadequate to maintain sufficient flow of fluid to the hydraulic pumps. Most non-pressurized reservoirs are constructed in a cylindrical shape. The outer housing is manufactured from a strong corrosion-resistant metal. Filter elements are normally installed within the reservoir to clean returning system hydraulic fluid. In some of the older aircraft, a filter bypass valve is incorporated to allow fluid to bypass the filter in the event the filter becomes clogged. Reservoirs can be serviced by pouring fluid directly into the reservoir through a filler strainer, finger strainer, assembly incorporated within the filler well to strain out impurities as the fluid enters the reservoir. Generally, non-pressurized reservoirs use a visual gauge to indicate the fluid quantity. 
Gauges incorporated on or in the reservoir may be a direct reading glass tube type or a float type rod that is visible through a transparent dome. In some cases, the fluid quantity may also be read in the cockpit through the use of quantity transmitters. A typical non-pressurized reservoir is shown in figure 12a. This reservoir consists of a welded body and cover assembly clamped together. Gaskets are incorporated to seal against leakage between assemblies. Non-pressurized reservoirs are slightly pressurized due to thermal expansion of fluid and the return of fluid to the reservoir from the main system. This pressure ensures that there is a positive flow of fluids to the inlet ports of the hydraulic pumps. Most reservoirs of this type are vented directly to the atmosphere or cabin with only a check valve and filter to control the outside air source. The reservoir system includes a pressure and vacuum relief valve. The purpose of the valve is to maintain a differential pressure range between the reservoir and cabin. A manual air bleed valve is installed on top of the reservoir to vent the reservoir. The valve is connected to the reservoir vent line to allow depressurization of the reservoir. The valve is actuated prior to servicing the reservoir to prevent fluid from being blown out of the filler as the cap is being removed. The manual bleed valve also needs to be actuated if hydraulic components need to be replaced. Pressurized reservoirs Reservoirs on aircraft designed for high-altitude flight are usually pressurized. Pressurizing assures a positive flow of fluid to the pump at high altitudes when low atmospheric pressures are encountered. On some aircraft, the reservoir is pressurized by bleed air taken from the compressor section of the engine. On others, the reservoir may be pressurized by hydraulic system pressure. Air pressurized reservoirs Air pressurized reservoirs are used in many commercial transport type aircraft. Figures 12 to 9 and 12 to 10, pressurization of the reservoir is required because the reservoirs are often located in wool wells or other non-pressurized areas of the aircraft, and at high altitude there is not enough atmospheric pressure to move the fluid to the pump inlet. Engine bleed air is used to pressurize the reservoir. The reservoirs are typically cylindrical in shape. The following components are installed on a typical reservoir. Reservoir pressure relief valve, prevents overpressurization of the reservoir. Valve opens at a preset value. Sight glasses, low and over full, provides visual indication for flight crews and maintenance personnel that the reservoir needs to be serviced. Reservoir sample valve, used to draw a sample of hydraulic fluid for testing. Reservoir drain valve, used to drain the fluids out of the reservoir for maintenance operation. Reservoir temperature transducer, provides hydraulic fluid temperature information for the flight deck. Figure 1211, reservoir quantity transmitter, transmits fluid quantity to the flight deck so that the flight crew can monitor fluid quantity during flight. Figure 1211, a reservoir pressurization module is installed close to the reservoir. Figure 1212, the reservoir pressurization module supplies airplane bleed air to the reservoirs. The module consists of the following parts. Filters, two, check valves, two, test port, manual bleed valve, gauge port A manual bleeder valve is incorporated into the module. During hydraulic system maintenance, it is necessary to relieve reservoir air pressure to assist in the installation and removal of components, lines, etc. This type of valve is small in size and has a push button installed in the outer case. When the bleeder valve push button is pushed, pressurized air from the reservoir flows through the valve to an overboard vent until the air pressure is depleted or the button is released. When the button is released, the internal spring causes the poppet to return to its seat. Some hydraulic fluid can escape from the manual bleed valve when the button is depressed. Caution, put a rag around the air bleed valve on the reservoir pressurization module to catch hydraulic fluid spray. Hydraulic fluid spray can cause injuries to persons. Fluid pressurized reservoir Some aircraft hydraulic system reservoirs are pressurized by hydraulic system pressure. Regulated hydraulic pump output pressure is applied to a movable piston inside the cylindrical reservoir. This small piston is attached to and moves a larger piston against the reservoir fluid. The reduced force of the small piston when applied by the larger piston is adequate to provide head pressure for high altitude operation. The small piston protrudes out of the body of the reservoir. The amount exposed is used as a reservoir fluid quantity indicator. Figure 1213 illustrates the concept behind the fluid pressurized hydraulic reservoir. The reservoir has five ports, pump suction, return, pressurizing, overboard drain, and bleed port. Fluid is supplied to the pump through the pump suction port. Fluid returns to the reservoir from the system through the return port. Pressure from the pump enters the pressurizing cylinder in the top of the reservoir through the pressurizing port. The overboard drain port drains the reservoir, when necessary, 
while performing maintenance. The bleed port is used as an aid in servicing the reservoir. When servicing a system equipped with this type of reservoir, place a container under the bleed drain port. The fluid should then be pumped into the reservoir until air-free fluid flows through the bleed drain port. The reservoir fluid level is indicated by the markings on the part of the pressurizing cylinder that moves through the reservoir dust cover assembly. There are three fluid level markings indicated on the cover, full at zero system pressure, full zero press, full when system is pressurized, full sys press, and refill. When the system is unpressurized and the pointer on the reservoir lies between the two full marks, a marginal reservoir fluid level is indicated. When the system is pressurized, and the pointer lies between refill and full sys press, a marginal reservoir fluid level is also indicated. Reservoir servicing non-pressurized reservoirs can be serviced by pouring fluid directly into the reservoir through a filler strainer, finger strainer, assembly incorporated within the filler well to strain out impurities as the fluid enters the reservoir. Many reservoirs also have a quick disconnect service port at the bottom of the reservoir. A hydraulic filler unit can be connected to the service port to add fluid to the reservoir. This method reduces the chances of contamination of the reservoir. Aircraft that use pressurized reservoirs often have a central filling station in the ground service bay to service all reservoirs from a single point. Figure 1214, a built-in hand pump is available to draw fluid from a container through a suction line and pump it into the reservoirs. Additionally, a pressure fill port is available for attachment of a hydraulic mule or serving cart, which uses an external pump to push fluid into the aircraft hydraulic system. A check valve keeps the hand pump output from exiting the pressure fill port. A single filter is located downstream of both the pressure fill port and the hand pump to prevent the introduction of contaminants during fluid servicing. It is very important to follow the maintenance instructions when servicing the reservoir. To get the correct results when the hydraulic fluid quantities are checked, or the reservoirs are to be filled, the airplane should be in the correct configuration. Failure to do so could result in over-servicing of the reservoir. This configuration could be different for each aircraft. The following service instructions are an example of a large transport type aircraft. Before servicing always make sure that the spoilers are retracted, landing gear is down, landing gear doors are closed, thrust reversers are retracted, and parking brake accumulator pressure reads at least 2,500 pounds per square inch. Filters A filter is a screening or straining device used to clean the hydraulic fluid, preventing foreign particles and contaminating substances from remaining in the system. Figure 1215, if such objectionable material were not removed, the entire hydraulic system of the aircraft could fail through the breakdown or malfunctioning of a single unit of the system. The hydraulic fluid holds in suspension tiny particles of metal that are deposited during the normal wear of selector valves, pumps, and other system components. Such minute particles of metal may damage the units and parts through which they pass if they are not removed by a filter. Since tolerances within the hydraulic system components are quite small, it is apparent that the reliability and efficiency of the entire system depends upon adequate filtering. Filters may be located within the reservoir, in the pressure line, in the return line, or in any other location the designer of the system decides that they are needed to safeguard the hydraulic system against impurities. Modern design often uses a filter module that contains several filters and other components. Figure 1216, there are many models and styles of filters. Their position in the aircraft and design requirements determine their shape and size. Most filters used in modern aircraft are of the inline type. The inline filter assembly is comprised of three basic units, head assembly, bowl, and element. The head assembly is secured to the aircraft structure and connecting lines. Within the head, there is a bypass valve that routes the hydraulic fluid directly from the inlet to the outlet port if the filter element becomes clogged with foreign matter. The bowl is the housing that holds the element to the filter head and is removed when element removal is required. The element may be a micron, porous metal, or magnetic type. The micron element is made of a specially treated paper and is normally thrown away when removed. The porous metal and magnetic filter elements are designed to be cleaned by various methods and replaced in the system. Micron type filters A typical micron type filter assembly utilizes an element made of specially treated paper that is formed in vertical convolutions wrinkles. An internal spring holds the elements in shape. The micron element is designed to prevent the passage of solids greater than 10 microns, 0.000394 inch, in size. Figure 1217, in the event that the filter element becomes clogged, the spring-loaded relief valve in the filter head bypasses the fluid after a differential pressure of 50 pounds per square inch has been built up. 
Hydraulic fluid enters the filter through the inlet port in the filter body and flows around the element inside the bowl. Filtering takes place as the fluid passes through the element into the hollow core, leaving the foreign material on the outside of the element. Maintenance of filters Maintenance of filters is relatively easy. It mainly involves cleaning the filter and element or cleaning the filter and replacing the element. Filters using the micron type element should have the element replaced periodically according to applicable instructions. Since reservoir filters are of the micron type, they must also be periodically changed or cleaned. For filters using other than the micron type element, cleaning the filter and element is usually all that is necessary. However, the element should be inspected very closely to ensure that it is completely undamaged. The methods and materials used in cleaning all filters are too numerous to be included in this text. Consult the manufacturer's instructions for this information. When replacing filter elements, be sure that there is no pressure on the filter bowl. Protective clothing and a face shield must be used to prevent fluid from contacting the eye. Replace the element with one that has the proper rating. After the filter element has been replaced, the system must be pressure tested to ensure that the sealing element in the filter assembly is intact. In the event of a major component failure, such as a pump, consideration must be given to replacing the system filter elements, as well as the failed component. Filter bypass valve filter modules are often equipped with a bypass relief valve. The bypass relief valve opens if the filter clogs, permitting continued hydraulic flow and operation of aircraft systems. Dirty oil is preferred over no flow at all. Figure 1218 shows the principle of operation of a filter bypass valve. The blow valve opens when the filter becomes clogged and the pressure over the filter increases. Filter differential pressure indicators the extent to which a filter element is loaded can be determined by measuring the drop in hydraulic pressure across the element under rated flow conditions. This drop, or differential pressure, provides a convenient means of monitoring the condition of installed filter elements and is the operating principle used in the differential pressure or loaded filter indicators found on many filter assemblies. Configurations, including electrical switches, continuous reading visual indicators, gauges, and visual indicators with memory. Visual indicators with memory usually take the form of magnetic or mechanically latched buttons or pins that extend when the differential pressure exceeds that allowed for a serviceable element. Figure 1218 top, when this increased pressure reaches a specific value, inlet pressure forces the spring-loaded magnetic piston downward, breaking the magnetic attachment between the indicator button and the magnetic piston. This allows the red indicator to pop out, signifying that the element must be cleaned. The button or pin, once extended, remains in that position until manually reset and provides a permanent, until reset, warning of a loaded element. This feature is particularly useful where it is impossible for an operator to continuously monitor the visual indicator, such as in a remote location on the aircraft. Some button indicators have a thermal lockout device incorporated in their design that prevents operation of the indicator below a certain temperature. The lockout prevents the higher differential pressure generated at cold temperatures by high fluid viscosity from causing a false indication of a loaded filter element. Differential pressure indicators are a component part of the filter assembly in which they are installed and are normally tested and overhauled as part of the complete assembly. With some model filter assemblies, however, it is possible to replace the indicator itself without removal of the filter assembly if it is suspected of being inoperative or out of calibration. It is important that the external surfaces of button type indicators be kept free of dirt or paint to ensure free movement of the button. Indications of excessive differential pressure, regardless of the type of indicator employed, should never be disregarded. All such indications must be verified and action taken, as required, to replace the loaded filter element. Failure to replace a loaded element can result in system starvation, filter element collapse, or the loss of filtration where bypass assemblies are used. Verification of loaded filter indications is particularly important with button type indicators as they may have been falsely triggered by mechanical shock, vibration, or cold start of the system. Verification is usually obtained by manually resetting the indicator and operating the system to create a maximum flow demand ensuring that the fluid is at near normal operating temperatures. Pumps All aircraft hydraulic systems have one or more power-driven pumps and may have a hand pump as an additional unit when the engine-driven pump is inoperative. Power-driven pumps are the primary source of energy and may be either engine-driven, electric motor-driven, or air-driven. As a general rule, electrical motor pumps are installed for use in emergencies or during ground operations. Some aircraft can deploy a ram air turbine, RAT, to generate hydraulic power. 
Hand pumps The hydraulic hand pump is used in some older aircraft for the operation of hydraulic subsystems and in a few newer aircraft systems as a backup unit. Hand pumps are generally installed for testing purposes, as well as for use in emergencies. Hand pumps are also installed to service the reservoirs from a single refilling station. The single refilling station reduces the chances for the introduction of fluid contamination. Several types of hand pumps are used, single action, double action, and rotary. A single action hand pump draws fluid into the pump on one stroke and pumps that fluid out on the next stroke. It is rarely used in aircraft due to this inefficiency. Double action hand pumps produce fluid flow and pressure on each stroke of the handle. Figure 1219, the double action hand pump consists essentially of a housing that has a cylinder bore and two ports, a piston, two spring-loaded check valves, and an operating handle. An o-ring on the piston seals against leakage between the two chambers of the piston cylinder bore. An o-ring and a groove in the end of the pump housing seals against leakage between the piston rod and housing. Chamber left of the piston is lowered. The inlet port ball check valve opens, and hydraulic fluid is drawn into the chamber. At the same time, the rightward movement of the piston forces the piston ball check valve against its seat. Fluid in the chamber to the right of the piston is forced out of the outlet port into the hydraulic system. When the piston is moved to the left, the inlet port ball check valve seats. Pressure in the chamber left of the piston rises, forcing the piston ball check valve off of its seat. Fluid flows from the left chamber through the piston to the right chamber. The volume in the chamber right of the piston is smaller than that of the left chamber due to the displacement created by the piston rod. As the fluid from the left chamber flows into the smaller right chamber, the excess volume of fluid is forced out of the outlet port to the hydraulic system. A rotary hand pump may also be employed. It produces continuous output while the handle is in motion. Figure 1220 shows a rotary hand pump in a hydraulic system. Power-driven pumps Many of the power-driven hydraulic pumps of current aircraft are of variable delivery, compensator-controlled type. Constant delivery pumps are also in use. Principles of operation are the same for both types of pumps. Modern aircraft use a combination of engine-driven power pumps, electrical-driven power pumps, air-driven power pumps, power transfer units, PTU, and pumps driven by a rat. For example, large aircraft, such as the Airbus A380, have two hydraulic systems, eight engine-driven pumps, and three electrical-driven pumps. The Boeing 777 has three hydraulic systems with two engine-driven pumps, four electrical-driven pumps, two air-driven pumps, and a hydraulic pump motor driven by the RAT. Figure 1221 and 12-22, classification of pumps All pumps may be classified as either positive displacement or non-positive displacement. Most pumps used in hydraulic systems are positive displacement. A non-positive displacement pump produces a continuous flow. However, because it does not provide a positive internal seal against slippage, its output varies considerably as pressure varies. Centrifugal and impeller pumps are examples of non-positive displacement pumps. If the output port of a non-positive displacement pump was blocked off, the pressure would rise, and output would decrease to zero. Although the pumping element would continue moving, flow would stop because of slippage inside the pump. In a positive displacement pump, slippage is negligible compared to the pump's volumetric output flow. If the output port were plugged, pressure would increase instantaneously to the point that the pump pressure relief valve opens. Constant displacement pumps A constant displacement pump, regardless of pump rotations per minute, forces a fixed or unvarying quantity of fluid through the outlet port during each revolution of the pump. Constant displacement pumps are sometimes called constant volume or constant delivery pumps. They deliver a fixed quantity of fluid per revolution, regardless of the pressure demands. Since the constant delivery pump provides a fixed quantity of fluid during each revolution of the pump, the quantity of fluid delivered per minute depends upon pump rotations per minute. When a constant displacement pump is used in a hydraulic system in which the pressure must be kept at a constant value, a pressure regulator is required. Gear type power pump A gear type power pump is a constant displacement pump. It consists of two meshed gears that revolve in a housing. Figure 1223, the driving gear is driven by the aircraft engine or some other power unit. The driven gear meshes with, and is driven by, the driving gear. Clearance between the teeth as they mesh and between the teeth and the housing is very small. The inlet port of the pump is connected to the reservoir, and the outlet port is connected to the pressure line. When the driving gear turns, as shown in figure 1223, it turns the driven gear. Fluid is captured by the teeth as they pass the inlet, and it travels around the housing and exits at the outlet. 
Gerotor pump A gerotor type power pump consists essentially of a housing containing an eccentric shaped stationary liner, an internal gear rotor having seven wide teeth of short height, a spur driving gear having six narrow teeth, and a pump cover that contains two crescent shaped openings. Figure 1224 One opening extends into an inlet port and the other extends into an outlet port. During the operation of the pump, the gears turn clockwise together. As the pockets between the gears on the left side of the pump move from a lowermost position toward a topmost position, the pockets increase in size, resulting in the production of a partial vacuum within these pockets. Since the pockets enlarge while over the inlet port crescent, fluid is drawn into them. As these same pockets, now full of fluid, rotate over to the right side of the pump, moving from the topmost position toward the lowermost position, they decrease in size. This results in the fluid being expelled from the pockets through the outlet port crescent. Piston pump Piston pumps can be constant displacement or variable displacement pumps. The common features of design and operation that are applicable to all piston type hydraulic pumps are described in the following paragraphs. Piston type power driven pumps have flanged mounting bases for the purpose of mounting the pumps on the accessory drive cases of aircraft engines. A pump drive shaft, which turns the mechanism, extends through the pump housing slightly beyond the mounting base. Torque from the driving unit is transmitted to the pump drive shaft by a drive coupling. The drive coupling is a short shaft with a set of male splines on both ends. The splines on one end engage with female splines in a driving gear, the splines on the other end engage with female splines in the pump drive shaft. Pump drive couplings are designed to serve as safety devices. The shear section of the drive coupling, located midway between the two sets of splines, is smaller in diameter than the splines. If the pump becomes unusually hard to turn or becomes jammed, this section shears, preventing damage to the pump or driving unit. Figure 1225, the basic pumping mechanism of piston-type pumps consists of a multiple bore. Cylinder block, a piston for each bore, and a valve plate with inlet and outlet slots. The purpose of the valve plate slots is to let fluid into and out of the bores as the pump operates. The cylinder bores lie parallel to and symmetrically around the pump axis. All aircraft axial piston pumps have an odd number of pistons. Figure 1226, Ben Axis Piston Pump A typical constant displacement axial type pump is shown in Figure 1227. The angular housing of the pump causes a corresponding angle to exist between the cylinder block and the drive shaft plate to which the pistons are attached. It is this angular configuration of the pump that causes the pistons to stroke as the pump shaft is turned. When the pump operates, all parts within the pump, except the outer races of the bearings that support the drive shaft, the cylinder bearing pin on which the cylinder block turns, and the oil seal, turn together as a rotating group. At one point of rotation of the rotating group, a minimum distance exists between the top of the cylinder block and the upper face of the drive shaft plate. Because of the angled housing at a point of rotation 180 degrees away, the distance between the top of the cylinder block and the upper face of the drive shaft plate is at a maximum. At any given moment of operation, three of the pistons are moving away from the top face of the cylinder block, producing a partial vacuum in the bores in which these pistons operate. This occurs over the inlet port, so fluid is drawn into these bores at this time. On the opposite side of the cylinder block, three different pistons are moving toward the top face of the block. This occurs while the rotating group is passing over the outlet port causing fluid to be expelled from the pump. By these pistons, the continuous and rapid action of the pistons is overlapping in nature and results in a practically non-pulsating pump output. Inline piston pump The simplest type of axial piston pump is the swashplate design in which a cylinder block is turned by the drive shaft. Pistons fitted to bores in the cylinder block are connected through piston shoes and a retracting ring so that the shoes bear against an angled swash plate. As the block turns, the piston shoes follow the swash plate, causing the pistons to reciprocate. The ports are arranged in the valve plate so that the pistons pass the inlet as they are pulled out and pass the outlet as they are forced back in. In these pumps, displacement is determined by the size and number of pistons, as well as their stroke length, which varies with the swash plate angle. This constant displacement pump is illustrated in figure 1226. Vane pump The vane type power pump is also a constant displacement pump. It consists of a housing containing four vanes blades, a hollow steel rotor with slots for the vanes, and a coupling to turn the rotor. Figure 1228, the rotor is positioned off-center within the sleeve. The vanes, which are mounted in the slots in the rotor, together with the rotor, divide the bore of the sleeve into four sections. As the rotor turns, each section passes one point where its volume is at a minimum and another point where its volume is at a maximum. 
The volume gradually increases from minimum to maximum during the first half of a revolution and gradually decreases from maximum to minimum during the second half of the revolution. As the volume of a given section increases, that section is connected to the pump inlet port through a slot in the sleeve. Since a partial vacuum is produced by the increase in volume of the section, fluid is drawn into the section through the pump inlet port and the slot in the sleeve. As the rotor turns through the second half of the revolution and the volume of the given section is decreasing, fluid is displaced out of the section, through the slot in the sleeve aligned with the outlet port and out of the pump. Variable displacement pump A variable displacement pump has a fluid output that is varied to meet the pressure demands of the system. The pump output is changed automatically by a pump compensator within the pump. The following paragraph discusses a two-stage Vickers variable displacement pump. The first stage of the pump consists of a centrifugal pump that boosts the pressure before the fluid enters the piston pump. Figure 1229, the aircraft's engine rotates the pump drive shaft, cylinder block, and pistons via a gearbox. Pumping action is generated by piston shoes that are restrained and slide on the shoe bearing plate in the yoke assembly. Because the yoke is at an angle to the drive shaft, the rotary motion of the shaft is converted to piston reciprocating motion. As the piston begins to withdraw from the cylinder block, system inlet pressure forces fluid through a porting arrangement in the valve plate into the cylinder bore. The piston shoes are restrained in the yoke by a piston shoe retaining plate and a shoe plate during the intake stroke. As the drive shaft continues to turn the cylinder block, the piston shoe continues following the yoke bearing surface. This begins to return the piston into its bore, i.e., toward the valve block. The fluid contained in the bore is pre-compressed, then expelled through the outlet port. Discharge pressure holds the piston shoe against the yoke bearing surface during the discharge stroke and also provides the shoe pressure balance and fluid film through an orifice in the piston and shoe subassembly. With each revolution of the drive shaft and cylinder block, each piston goes through the pumping cycle described above, completing one intake and one discharge stroke. High pressure fluid is ported out through the valve plate, past the blocking valve, to the pump outlet. The blocking valve is designed to remain open during normal pump operation. Internal leakage keeps the pump housing filled with fluid for lubrication of rotating parts and cooling. The leakage is returned to the system through a case drain port. The case valve relief valve protects the pump against excessive case pressure, relieving it to the pump inlet. Normal pumping mode The pressure compensator is a spool valve that is held in the closed position by an adjustable spring load. Figure 1230, when pump outlet pressure, System pressure, exceeds the pressure setting, 2,850 pounds per square inch for full flow, the spool moves to admit fluid from the pump outlet against the yoke actuator piston. In figure 1230, the pressure compensator is shown a cracking pressure, the pump outlet pressure is just high enough to move the spool to begin admitting fluid to the actuator piston. The yoke is supported inside the pump housing on two bearings. At pump outlet pressures below 2,850 pounds per square inch, the yoke is held at its maximum angle relative to the drive shaft centerline by the force of the yoke return spring. Decreasing system flow demand causes outlet pressure to become high enough to crack the compensator valve open and admit fluid to the actuator piston. This control pressure overcomes the yoke return spring force and strokes the pump yoke to a reduced angle. The reduced angle of the yoke results in a shorter stroke for the pistons and reduced displacement. Figure 1231 the lower displacement results in a corresponding reduction in pump flow. The pump delivers only that flow required to maintain the desired pressure in the system. When there is no demand for flow from the system, the yoke angle decreases to nearly zero degrees stroke angle. In this mode, the unit pumps only its own internal leakage. Thus, at pump outlet pressures above 2,850 pounds per square inch, pump displacement decreases as outlet pressure rises. At system pressures below this level, no fluid is admitted through the pressure compensator valve to the actuator piston and the pump remains at full displacement, delivering full flow. Pressure is then determined by the system demand. The unit maintains zero flow at system pressure of 3,025 pounds per square inch. Depressurized mode when the solenoid valve is energized, the electrical depressurization valve, EDV solenoid valve moves up against the spring force and the outlet fluid is ported to the EDV control piston on the top of the compensator, depressurizing piston. Figure 1232, the high pressure fluid pushes the compensator spool beyond its normal metering position. This removes the compensator valve from the circuit and connects the actuator piston directly to the pump outlet. Outlet fluid is also ported to the blocking valve spring chamber, which equalizes pressure on both sides of its plunger. 
The blocking valve closes due to the force of the blocking valve spring and isolates the pump from the external hydraulic system. The pump strokes itself to zero delivery the actuator piston to reduce the yoke angle to nearly zero, approximately 1,100 pounds per square inch. This depressurization and blocking feature can be used to reduce the load on the engine during startup and, in a multiple pump system, to isolate one pump at a time and check for proper system pressure output. Valves flow control valves flow control valves control the speed and or direction of fluid flow in the hydraulic system. They provide for the operation of various components when desired and the speed at which the component operates. Examples of flow control valves include, selector valves, check valves, sequence valves, priority valves, shuttle valves, quick disconnect valves, and hydraulic fuses. Selector valves A selector valve is used to control the direction of movement of a hydraulic actuating cylinder or similar device. It provides for the simultaneous flow of hydraulic fluid both into and with the selector valve to operate the unit in either direction and a corresponding return path for the fluid to the reservoir is provided. There are two main types of selector valves, open center and closed center. An open center valve allows a continuous flow of system hydraulic fluid through the valve even when the selector is not in a position to actuate a unit. A closed center selector valve blocks the flow of fluid through the valve when it is in the neutral or off position. Figure 1233A, selector valves may be poppet type, spool type, piston type, rotary type, or plug type. Figure 1234. Regardless, each selector valve has a unique number of ports. The number of ports is determined by the particular requirements of the system in which the valve is used. Closed centered selector valves with four ports are most common in aircraft hydraulic systems. These are known as four-way valves. Figure 1233 illustrates how this valve connects to the pressure and return lines of the hydraulic system, as well as to the two ports on a common actuator. Most selector valves are by solenoid or servo. Figure 1235, the four ports on a four-way selector valve always have the same function. One port receives pressurized fluid from the system hydraulic pump. A second port always returns fluid to the reservoir. The third and fourth ports are used to connect the selector valve to the actuating unit. There are two ports on the actuating unit. When the selector valve is positioned to connect pressure to one port on the actuator, the other actuator port is simultaneously connected to the reservoir return line through selector valve. Figure 1233B, thus, the unit operates in a certain direction. When the selector valve is positioned to connect pressure to the other port on the actuating unit, the original port is simultaneously connected to the return line through the selector valve and the unit operates in the opposite direction. Figure 1233C, Figure 1236 illustrates the internal flow paths of a solenoid-operated selector valve. The closed center valve is shown in the neutral or off position. Neither solenoid is energized. The pressure port routes fluid to the center lobe on the spool, which blocks the flow. Fluid pressure flows through the pilot valves and applies equal pressure on both ends of the spool. The actuator lines are connected around the spool to the return line. When selected via a switch in the cockpit, the right solenoid is energized. The right pilot valve plug shifts left, which blocks pressurized fluid from reaching the right end of the main spool. The spool slides to the right due to greater pressure applied on the left end of the spool. The center lobe of the spool no longer blocks system pressurized fluid, which flows to the actuator through the left actuator line. At the same time, return flow is blocked from the main spool left chamber so the actuator, not shown, moves in the selected direction. Return fluid from the moving actuator flows through the right actuator line past the spool and into the return line. Figure 1237, typically, the actuator or moving device contacts a limit switch when the desired motion is complete. The switch causes the right solenoid to de-energize and the right pilot valve reopens. Pressurized fluid can once again flow through the pilot valve and into the main spool right end chamber. There, the spring and fluid pressure shift the spool back to the left into the neutral or off position shown in figure 1236. To make the actuator move in the opposite direction, the cockpit switch is moved in the opposite direction. All motion inside the selector valve is the same as described above but in the opposite direction. The left solenoid is energized. Pressure is applied to the actuator through the right port and return fluid from the left actuator line is connected to the return port through the motion of the spool to the left. Check valve Another common flow control valve in aircraft hydraulic systems is the check valve. A check valve allows fluid to flow unimpeded in one direction but prevents or restricts fluid flow in the opposite direction. 
A check valve may be an independent component situated in line somewhere in the hydraulic system or it may be built into a component. When part of a component, the check valve is said to be an integral check valve. A typical check valve consists of a spring-loaded ball and seat inside a housing. The spring compresses to allow fluid flow in the design direction. When flow stops, the spring pushes the ball against the seat which prevents fluid from flowing in the opposite direction through the valve. An arrow on the outside of the housing indicated the direction in which fluid flow is permitted. Figure 1238, a check valve may also be constructed with spring-loaded flapper or cone-shaped piston instead of a ball. Orifice type check valve Some check valves allow full fluid flow in one direction and restricted flow in the opposite direction. These are known as orifice type check valves, or damping valves. The valve contains the same spring ball and seat combination as a normal check valve, but the seat area has a calibrated orifice machined into it. Thus, fluid flow is unrestricted in the design direction while the ball is pushed off of its seat. The downstream actuator operates at full speed. When fluid backflows into the valve, the spring forces the ball against the seat which limits fluid flow to the amount that can pass through the orifice. The reduced flow in this opposite direction slows the motion, or dampens, the actuator associated with the check valve. Figure 1238. An orifice check valve may be included in a hydraulic landing gear actuator system. When the gear is raised, the check valve allows full fluid flow to lift the heavy gear at maximum speed. When lowering the gear, the orifice in the check valve prevents the gear from violently dropping by restricting fluid flow out of the actuating cylinder. Sequence valves Sequence valves control the sequence of operation between two branches in a circuit. They enable one unit to automatically set another unit into motion. An example of the use of a sequence valve is in an aircraft landing gear actuating system. In a landing gear actuating system, the landing gear doors must open before the landing gear starts to extend. Conversely, the landing gear must be completely retracted before the doors close. A sequence valve installed in each landing gear actuating line performs this function. A sequence valve is somewhat similar to a relief valve except that, after the set pressure has been reached, the sequence valve diverts the fluid to a second actuator or motor to do work in another part of the system. There are various types of sequence valves. Some are controlled by pressure, some are controlled mechanically, and some are controlled by electric switches. Pressure-controlled sequence valve The operation of a typical pressure-controlled sequence valve is illustrated in figure 1236. The opening pressure is holds the piston in the closed position. Note that the top part of the piston has a larger diameter than the lower part. Fluid enters the valve through the inlet port, flows around the lower part of the piston and exits the outlet port, where it flows to the primary, first, unit to be operated. Figure 1239A, this fluid pressure also acts against the lower surface of the piston. When the primary actuating unit completes its operation, pressure in the line to the actuating unit increases sufficiently to overcome the force of the spring, and the piston rises. The valve is then in the open position. Figure 1239b, the fluid entering the valve takes the path of least resistance and flows to the secondary unit. A drain passage is provided to allow any fluid leaking past the piston to flow from the top of the valve. In hydraulic systems, this drain line is usually connected to the main return line. The mechanically operated sequence valve is operated by a plunger that extends through the body of the valve. Figure 1240, the valve is mounted so that the plunger is operated by the primary unit. A check valve, either a ball or a poppet, is installed between the fluid ports in the body. It can be unseated by either the plunger or fluid pressure. Port A and the actuator of the primary unit are connected by a common line. Port B is connected by a line to the actuator of the secondary unit. When fluid under pressure flows to the primary unit, it also flows into the sequence valve through port A to the seated check valve and the sequence valve. In order to operate the secondary unit, the fluid must flow through the sequence valve. The valve is located so that the primary unit moves the plunger as it completes its operation. The plunger unseats the check valve and allows the fluid to flow through the valve, out port B, and to the secondary unit. Priority valves A priority valve gives priority to the critical hydraulic subsystems over non-critical systems when system pressure is low. For instance, if the pressure of the priority valve is set for 2,200 pounds per square inch, all systems receive pressure when the pressure is above 2,200 pounds per square inch. If the pressure drops below 2,200 pounds per square inch, the priority valve closes, and no fluid pressure flows to the non-critical systems. Figure 1241 
Some hydraulic designs use pressure switches and electrical shutoff valves to assure that the critical systems have priority over non-critical systems when system pressure is low. Quick disconnect valves Quick disconnect valves are installed in hydraulic lines to prevent loss of fluid when units are removed. Such valves are installed in the pressure and suction lines of the system immediately upstream and downstream of the power pump. In addition to pump removal, a power pump can be disconnected from the system and a hydraulic test stand connected in its place. These valve units consist of two interconnecting sections coupled together by a nut when installed in the system. Each valve section has a piston and poppet assembly. These are spring-loaded to the closed position when the unit is disconnected. Figure 1242, Hydraulic Fuses A hydraulic fuse is a safety device. Fuses may be installed at strategic locations throughout a hydraulic system. They detect a sudden increase in flow, such as a burst downstream, and shut off the fluid flow. By closing, a fuse preserves hydraulic fluid for the rest of the system. Hydraulic fuses are fitted to the brake system, leading edge flap and slat extend and retract lines, nose landing gear up and down lines, and the thrust reverser pressure and return lines. One type of fuse, referred to as the automatic resetting type, is designed to allow a certain volume of fluid per minute to pass excessive, the fuse closes and shuts off the flow. When the pressure is removed from the pressure supply side of the fuse, it automatically resets itself to the open position. Fuses are usually cylindrical in shape, with an inlet and outlet port at opposite ends. Figure 1243, Pressure control valves the safe and efficient operation of fluid power systems, system components, and related equipment requires a means of controlling pressure. There are many types of automatic pressure control valves. Some of them are an escape for pressure that exceeds a set pressure. Some only reduce the pressure to a lower pressure system or subsystem, and some keep the pressure in a system within a required range. Relief valves hydraulic pressure must be regulated in order to use it to perform the desired tasks. A pressure relief valve is used to limit the amount of pressure being exerted on a confined liquid. This is necessary to prevent failure of components or rupture of hydraulic lines under excessive pressures. The pressure relief valve is, in effect, a system safety valve. The design of pressure relief valves incorporates adjustable spring-loaded valves. They are installed in such a manner as to discharge fluid from the pressure line into a reservoir return line when the pressure exceeds the predetermined maximum for which the valve is adjusted. Various makes and designs of pressure relief valves are in use, but, in general, they all employ a spring-loaded valving device operated by hydraulic pressure and spring tension. Figure 1244, pressure relief valves are adjusted by increasing or decreasing the tension on the spring to determine the pressure required to open the valve. They may be classified by type of construction or uses in the system. The most common types of valve are, 1. Ball type, in pressure relief valves with a ball type valving device, the ball rests on a contoured seat. Pressure acting on the bottom of the ball pushes it off its seat, allowing the fluid to bypass. 2. Sleeve type, in pressure relief valves with a sleeve type valving device, the ball remains stationary and a sleeve type seat is moved up by the fluid pressure. This allows the fluid to bypass between the ball and the sliding sleeve type seat. 3. Poppet type, in pressure relief valves with a poppet type valving device, a cone-shaped poppet may have any of several design configurations, however, it is basically a cone and seat machined at matched angles to prevent leakage. As the pressure rises to its predetermined setting, the poppet is lifted off its seat, as in the ball-type device. This allows the fluid to pass through the opening created and out the return port. Pressure relief valves cannot be used as pressure regulators in large hydraulic systems that depend on engine-driven pumps for the primary source of pressure because the pump is constantly under load and the energy expended in holding the pressure relief valve off its seat is changed into heat. This heat is transferred to the fluid and, in turn, to the packing rings, causing them to deteriorate rapidly. Pressure relief valves, however, may be used as pressure regulators in small, low-pressure systems or when the pump is electrically driven and is used intermittently. Pressure relief valves may be used as, 1. System relief valve, the most common use of the pressure relief valve is as a safety device against the possible failure of a pump compensator or other pressure regulating device. All hydraulic systems that have hydraulic pumps incorporate pressure relief valves as safety devices. 2. Thermal relief valve, the pressure relief valve is used to relieve excessive pressures that may exist due to thermal expansion of the fluid. They are used where a check valve or selector valve prevents pressure from being relieved through the main system relief valve. Thermal relief valves are usually smaller than system relief valves. 
As pressurized fluid in the line in which it is installed builds to an excessive amount, the valve poppet is forced off its seat. This allows excessive pressurized fluid to flow through the relief valve to the reservoir return line. When system pressure decreases to a predetermined pressure, spring tension overcomes system pressure and forces the valve poppet to the closed position. Pressure regulators The term pressure regulator is applied to a device used in hydraulic systems that are pressurized by constant delivery type pumps. One purpose of the pressure regulator is to manage the output of the pump to maintain system operating pressure within a predetermined range. The other purpose is to permit the pump to turn without resistance, termed unloading the pump, at times when pressure in the system is within normal operating range. The pressure regulator is located in the system so that pump output can get into the system pressure circuit only by passing through the regulator. The combination of a constant delivery type pump and the pressure regulator is virtually the equivalent of a compensator controlled, variable delivery type pump. Figure 1245 Pressure reducers Pressure reducing valves are used in hydraulic systems where it is necessary to lower the normal system operating pressure by a specified amount. Pressure reducing valves provide a steady pressure into a system that operates at a lower pressure than the supply system. A reducing valve can normally be set for any desired downstream pressure within the design limits of the valve. Once the valve is set, the reduced pressure is maintained regardless of changes in supply pressure, as long as the supply pressure is at least as high as the reduced pressure desired, and regardless of the system load, if the load does not exceed the design capacity of the reducer. Figure 1246, shuttle valves in certain fluid power systems, the supply of fluid to a subsystem must be for more than one source to meet system requirements. In some systems, an emergency system is provided as a source of pressure in the event of normal system failure. The emergency system usually actuates only essential components. The main purpose of the shuttle valve is to isolate the normal system from an alternate or emergency system. It is small and simple, yet it is a very important component. Figure 1247. The housing contains three ports, normal system inlet, alternate or emergency system inlet, and outlet. A shuttle valve used to operate more than one actuating unit may contain additional unit outlet ports. Enclosed in the housing is a sliding part called the shuttle. Its purpose is to seal off one of the inlet ports. There is a shuttle seat at each inlet port. When a shuttle valve is in the normal operation position, fluid has a free flow from the normal system inlet port, through the valve, and out through the outlet port to the actuating unit. The shuttle is seated against the alternate system inlet port and held there by normal system pressure and by the shuttle valve spring. The shuttle remains in this position until the alternate system is activated. This action directs fluid under pressure from the alternate system to the shuttle valve and forces the shuttle from the alternate system inlet port to the normal system inlet port. Fluid from the alternate system then has a free flow to the outlet port but is prevented from entering the normal system by the shuttle, which seals off the normal system port. The shuttle may be one of four types, 1. Sliding plunge 2. Spring-loaded piston 3. Spring-loaded ball 4. Spring-loaded poppet in shuttle valves that are designed with a spring, the shuttle is normally held against the alternate system inlet port by the spring. Shutoff valves Shutoff valves are used to shut off the flow of fluid to a particular system or component. In general, these types of valves are electrically powered. Shutoff valves are also used to create a priority in a hydraulic system and are controlled by pressure switches. Figure 1248 Accumulators The accumulator is a steel sphere divided into two chambers by a synthetic rubber diaphragm. The upper chamber contains fluid at system pressure, while the lower chamber is charged with nitrogen or air. Cylindrical types are also used in high-pressure hydraulic systems. Many aircraft have several accumulators in the hydraulic system. There may be a main system accumulator and an emergency system accumulator. There may also be auxiliary accumulators located in various subsystems. The function of an accumulator is to Dampen pressure surges in the hydraulic system caused by actuation of a unit and the effort of the pump to maintain pressure at a preset level. Aid or supplement the power pump when several units are operating at once by supplying extra power from its accumulated, or stored, power. Store power for the limited operation of a hydraulic unit when the pump is not operating. Supply fluid under pressure to compensate for small internal or external, not desired, Leaks that would cause the system to cycle continuously by action of the pressure switches continually kicking in. Types of accumulators There are two general types of accumulators used in aircraft hydraulic systems, spherical and cylindrical. 
Spherical to spherical type accumulator is constructed in two halves that are fastened and threaded, or welded, together. Two threaded openings exist. The top port accepts fittings to connect to the pressurized hydraulic system to the accumulator. The bottom port is fitted with a gas servicing valve, such as a Schrader valve. A synthetic rubber diaphragm, or bladder, is installed in the sphere to create two chambers. Pressurized hydraulic fluid occupies the upper chamber and nitrogen or air charges the lower chamber. A screen at the fluid pressure port keeps the diaphragm, or bladder, from extruding through the port when the lower chamber is charged, and hydraulic fluid pressure is zero. A rigid button or disc may also be attached to the diaphragm, or bladder, for this purpose. Figure 1249, the bladder is installed through a large opening in the bottom of the sphere and is secured with a threaded retainer plug. The gas servicing valve mounts into the retainer plug. Cylindrical cylindrical accumulators consist of a cylinder and piston assembly. End caps are attached to both ends of the cylinder. The internal piston separates the fluid and air slash nitrogen chambers. The end caps and piston are sealed with gaskets and packings to prevent external leakage around the end caps and internal leakage between the chambers. In one end cap, a hydraulic fitting is used to attach the fluid chamber to the hydraulic system. In the other end cap, a filler valve is installed to perform the same function as the filler valve installed in the spherical accumulator. Figure 1250, Operation in Operation, the compressed air chamber is charged to a predetermined pressure that is somewhat lower than the system operating pressure. This initial charge is referred to as the accumulator preload. As an example of accumulator operation, let us assume that the cylindrical accumulator is designed for a preload of 1,300 pounds per square inch in a 3,000 pounds per square inch system. When the initial charge of 1,300 pounds per square inch is introduced into the unit, hydraulic system pressure is zero. As air pressure is applied through a gas servicing valve, it moves the piston toward the opposite end until it bottoms. If the air behind the piston has a pressure of 1,300 pounds per square inch, the hydraulic system pump has to create a pressure within the system greater than 1,300 pounds per square inch before the hydraulic fluid can actuate the piston. At 1,301 pounds per square inch the piston starts to move within the cylinder, compressing the air as it moves. At 2,000 pounds per square inch, it has backed up several inches. At 3,000 pounds per square inch, the piston has backed up to its normal operating position, compressing the air until it occupies a space less than one-half the length of the cylinder. When actuation of hydraulic units lowers the system pressure, the compressed air expands against the piston, forcing fluid from the accumulator. This supplies an instantaneous supply of fluid to the hydraulic system component. The charged accumulator may also supply fluid pressure to actuate a component's briefly in case of pump failure. Maintenance of accumulators Maintenance consists of inspections, minor repairs, replacement of component parts, and testing. There is an element of danger in maintaining accumulators. Therefore, proper precautions must be strictly observed to prevent injury and damage. Before disassembling any accumulator, ensure that all preload air or nitrogen pressure has been discharged. Failure to release the preload could result in serious injury to the technician. Before making this check, be certain you know the type of high-pressure air valve used. When you know that all air pressure has been removed, you can take the unit apart. Be sure to follow manufacturer's instructions for the specific unit you have. Heat exchangers transport type aircraft use heat exchangers in their hydraulic power supply system to cool the hydraulic fluid from the hydraulic pumps. This extends the service life of the fluid and the hydraulic pumps. They are located in the fuel tanks of the aircraft. The heat exchangers use aluminum fin tubes to transfer heat from the fluid to the fuel. The fuel in the tanks that contain the heat exchangers must be maintained at a specific level to ensure adequate cooling of the fluid. Figure 1251 Actuators and actuating cylinder transforms energy in the form of fluid pressure into mechanical force, or action, to perform work. It is used to impart powered linear motion to some movable object or mechanism. A typical actuating cylinder consists of a cylinder housing, one or more pistons and piston rods, and some seals. The cylinder housing contains a polished bore in which the piston operates, and one or more ports through which fluid enters and leaves the bore. The piston and rod form an assembly. The piston moves forward and backward within the cylinder bore, and an attached piston rod moves into and out of the cylinder housing through an opening in one end of the cylinder housing. Seals are used to prevent leakage between the piston and the cylinder bore and between the piston rod and the end of the cylinder. 
both the cylinder housing and the piston rod have provisions for mounting and for attachment to an object or mechanism that is to be moved by the actuating cylinder. Actuating cylinders are of two major types, single action and double action. The single action, single port, actuating cylinder is capable of producing powered movement in one direction only. The double action, two ports, actuating cylinder is capable of producing powered movement in two directions. Linear actuators A single action actuating cylinder is illustrated in figure 1252A. Fluid under pressure enters the port at the left and pushes against the face of the piston, forcing the piston to the right. As the piston moves, air is forced out of the spring chamber through the vent hole, compressing the spring. When pressure on the fluid is released to the point it exerts less force than is present in the compressed spring, the spring pushes the piston toward the left. As the piston moves to the left, fluid is forced out of the fluid port. At the same time, the moving piston pulls air into the spring chamber through the vent hole. A three-way control valve is normally used for controlling the operation of a single-action actuating cylinder. A double-action, two ports, actuating cylinder is illustrated in figure 1252B. The operation of a double-action actuating cylinder is usually controlled by a four-way selector valve. Figure 1253 shows an actuating cylinder interconnected with a selector valve. Operation of the selector valve and actuating cylinder is discussed below. When the selector valve is placed in the on or extend position, fluid is admitted under pressure to the left-hand chamber of the actuating cylinder. Figure 1253, this results in the piston being forced toward the right. As the piston moves toward the right, it pushes return fluid out of the right-hand chamber and through the selector valve to the reservoir. When the selector valve is placed in its retract position, as illustrated in figure 1250, fluid pressure enters the right chamber, forcing the piston toward the left. As the piston moves toward the left, it pushes return fluid out of the left chamber and through the selector valve to the reservoir. Double acting cylinder also has the ability to hold a load in position. This capability exists because when the selector valve used to control operation of the actuating cylinder is placed in the off position, Fluid is trapped in the chambers on both sides of the actuating cylinder piston. Internal locking actuators also are used in some applications. Rotary actuators Rotary actuators can mount right at the part without taking up the long stroke lengths required of cylinders. Rotary actuators are not limited to the 90 degrees pivot arc typical of cylinders. They can achieve arc lengths of 180 degrees, 360 degrees, or even 720 degrees or more, depending on the configuration. An often used type of rotary actuator is the rack and pinion actuator used for many nose wheel steering mechanisms. In a rack and pinion actuator, a long piston with one side machined into a rack engages a pinion to turn the output shaft. Figure 1254, one side of the piston receives fluid pressure while the other side is connected to the return. When the piston moves, it rotates the pinion. Hydraulic motor piston type motors are the most commonly used in hydraulic systems. Figure 1255, they are basically the same as hydraulic pumps except they are used to convert hydraulic energy into mechanical, rotary energy. Hydraulic motors are either of the axial inline or bent axis type. The most commonly used hydraulic motor is the fixed displacement bent axis type. These types of motors are used for the activation of trailing edge flaps, leading edge slats, and stabilizer trim. Some equipment uses a variable displacement piston motor where very wide speed ranges are desired. Although some piston-type motors are controlled by directional control valves, they are often used in combination with variable displacement pumps. This pump-motor combination is used to provide a transfer of power between a driving element and a driven element. Some applications for which hydraulic transmissions may be used are speed reducers, variable speed drives, constant speed or constant torque drives, and torque converters. Some advantages of hydraulic transmission of power over mechanical transmission of power are as follows. Quick, Easy speed adjustment over a wide range while the power source is operating at a constant, most efficient, speed, rapid, smooth acceleration or deceleration, control over maximum torque and power, cushioning effect to reduce shock load smoother reversal of motion ram air turbine, RAT, the RAT is installed in the aircraft to provide electrical and hydraulic power if the primary sources of aircraft power are lost. Ram air is used to turn the blades of a turbine that, in turn, operates a hydraulic pump and generator. The turbine and a door installed in the fuselage. The door is hinged, allowing the assembly to be extended into the slipstream by pulling a manual release in the flight deck. In some aircraft, the rat automatically deploys when the main hydraulic pressure system fails, and or electrical system malfunction occurs. 
Figure 1256, Power Transfer Unit, PTU, the PTU is able to transfer power but not fluid. It transfers power between two hydraulic systems. Different types of PTUs are in use, some can only transfer power in one direction while others can transfer power both ways. Some PTUs have a fixed displacement, while others use a variable and hydraulic motor, are connected via a single drive shaft so that power can be transferred between the two systems. Depending on the direction of power transfer, each unit in turn works either as a motor or a pump. Figure 1257, Hydraulic Motor Driven Generator, HMDG, the HMDG is a servo-controlled variable displacement motor integrated with an AC generator. The HMDG is designed to maintain a desired output frequency of 400 Hz. In case of an electrical failure, the HMDG could provide an alternative source of electrical power. Seal seals are used to prevent fluid from passing a certain point, and to keep air and dirt out of the system in which they are used. The increased use of hydraulics and pneumatics in aircraft systems has created a need for packings and gaskets of varying characteristics, and designed to meet the many variations of operating speeds and temperatures to which they are subjected. No one style or type of seal is satisfactory for all installations. Some of the reasons for this are, pressure at which the system operates, the type fluid used in the system, the metal finish and the clearance between adjacent parts, the type motion, rotary or reciprocating, if any, such as an O-ring and a backup ring, or possibly an O-ring and two backup rings. Hydraulic seals used internally on a sliding or moving assembly are normally called packings. Figure 1258, hydraulic seals used between non-moving fittings and bosses are normally called gaskets. V-ring packings V-ring packings, AN6225, are one-way seals and are always installed with the open end of the V facing the pressure. V-ring packings must have a male and female adapter to hold them in the proper position after installation. It is also necessary to torque the seal retainer to the value specified by the manufacturer of the component being serviced, or the seal may not give satisfactory service. U ring U ring packings, AN6226, and U cup packings are used in brake assemblies and brake master cylinders. The U ring and U cup seals pressure in only one direction, therefore, the lip of the packings must face toward the pressure. U ring packings are primarily low pressure packings to be used with pressures of less than 1,000 pounds per square inch. In the form of O rings, an O ring is circular in shape, and its cross section is small in relation to its diameter. The cross-section is truly round and has been molded and trimmed to extremely close tolerances. The O-ring packing seals effectively in both directions. This sealing is done by distortion of its elastic compound. Advances in aircraft design have made new O-ring composition necessary to meet changing conditions. Hydraulic O-rings were originally established under Air Force Navy, and specification numbers 6227, 6230, and 6,290 for use in fluid at operating temperatures ranging from minus 65 degrees Fahrenheit to plus 160 degrees Fahrenheit. When new designs raised operating temperatures to a possible plus 275 degrees Fahrenheit, more compounds were developed and perfected. Recently, newer compounds were developed under military standard, MS, specifications that offered improved low temperature performance without sacrificing high temperature performance. These superior materials were adopted in the MS-28775 O-ring, which is replacing AN-6227 and AN-6230 O-rings, and the MS-28778 O-ring, which is replacing the AN-6290 O-ring. These O-rings are now standard for systems where the operating temperatures may vary from minus 65 degrees Fahrenheit to plus 275 degrees Fahrenheit. O-ring color coding manufacturers provide color coding on some O-rings, but this is not a reliable or complete means of identification. The color coding system does not identify sizes, but only system fluid or vapor compatibility and, in some cases, the manufacturer. Color codes on O-rings that are compatible with mil h 5606 fluid always contains blue but may also contain red or other colors. Packings and gaskets suitable for use with phosphate ester-based fluids are always coated with a green stripe but may also have a blue, gray, red, green, or yellow dot as a part of the color code. Color codes on O-rings that are compatible with hydrocarbon fluid always contain red, but never contain blue. A colored stripe around the circumference indicates that the O-ring is a boss gasket seal. The color of the stripe indicates fluid compatibility, red for fuel, blue for hydraulic fluid. The coating on some rings is not permanent. 
On others, it may be emitted due to manufacturing difficulties or interference with operation. Furthermore, the color coding system provides no means to establish the age of the O-ring or its temperature limitations. Because of the difficulties with color coding, O-rings are available in individual hermetically sealed envelopes labeled with all pertinent data. When selecting an O-ring for installation, the basic part number on the sealed envelope provides the most reliable compound identification. Backup rings Backup rings, MS28782, made of Teflon do not deteriorate with age, are unaffected by any system fluid or vapor, and can tolerate temperature extremes in excess of those encountered in high-pressure hydraulic systems. Their dash numbers indicate not only their size but also relate directly to the dash number of the O-ring for which they are dimensionally suited. They are procurable under a number of basic part numbers, but they are interchangeable. Any Teflon backup ring may be used to replace any other Teflon backup ring if it is of proper overall dimension to support the applicable O-ring. Backup rings are not color-coded or otherwise marked and must be identified from package labels. The inspection of backup rings should include a check to ensure that surfaces are free from irregularities, that the edges are clean cut and sharp, and that scarf cuts are parallel. When checking Teflon spiral backup rings, make sure that the coils do not separate more than one quarter inch when unrestrained. Be certain that backup rings are installed downstream of the O-ring. Figure 1259, gaskets gaskets are used as static, stationary, seals between two flat surfaces. Some of the more common gasket materials are Asbestos, copper, cork and rubber. Asbestos sheeting is used wherever a heat-resistant gasket is needed. It is used extensively for exhaust system gaskets. Most asbestos exhaust gaskets have a thin sheet of copper edging to prolong their life. A solid copper washer is used for spark plug gaskets where it is essential to have a non-compressible, yet semi-soft gasket. Cork gaskets can be used as an oil seal between the engine crankcase and accessories, and where a gasket is required that is capable of occupying an uneven or varying space caused by a rough surface or expansion and contraction. Rubber sheeting can be used where there is a need for a compressible gasket. It should not be used in any place where it may come in contact with gasoline or oil because the rubber deteriorates very rapidly when exposed to these substances. Gaskets are used in fluid systems around the end caps of actuating cylinders, valves, and other units. The gasket generally used for this purpose is in the shape of an O-ring, similar to O-ring packings. Seal materials Most seals are made from synthetic materials that are compatible with the hydraulic fluid used. Seals used for mil H5606 hydraulic fluid are not compatible with phosphate ester-based fluids and servicing the hydraulic system with the wrong fluid could result in leaks and system malfunctions. Seals for systems that use mil H5606 are made of neoprene or bunaan. Seals for phosphate ester-based fluids are made from butyl rubber or ethylene propylene elastomers. O-ring installation when removing or installing O-rings, avoid using pointed or sharp edge tools that might cause scratching or marring of hydraulic component surfaces or cause damage to the O-rings. Special tooling for the installation of O-rings is available. While using the seal removal and the installation tools, contact with cylinder walls, piston heads and related precision components is not desirable. After the removal of all O-rings, the parts that receive new O-rings have to be cleaned and inspected to make sure that they are free from all contamination. Each replacement O-ring should be removed from its sealed package and inspected for defects, such as blemishes, abrasions, cuts, or punctures. Although an O-ring may appear perfect at first glance, slight surface flaws may exist. These flaws are often capable of preventing satisfactory O-ring performance under the variable operating pressures of aircraft systems, therefore, O-rings should be rejected for flaws that affect their performance. Such flaws are difficult to detect, and one aircraft manufacturer recommends using a four-power magnifying glass with adequate lighting to inspect each ring before it is installed. By rolling the ring on an inspection cone or dowel, the inner diameter surface can also be checked for small cracks, particles of foreign material, or other irregularities that cause leakage or shorten the life of the O-ring. The slight stretching of the ring when it is rolled inside out helps to reveal some defects not otherwise visible. After inspection and prior to installation, immerse the O-ring in clean hydraulic fluid. During the installation, avoid rolling and twisting the O-ring to maneuver it into place. If possible, keep the position of the O-ring's mold line constant. When the O-ring installation requires spanning or inserting through sharply threaded areas, ridges, slots, and edges, use protective measures, such as O-ring entering sleeves, as shown in figure 1260A. After the O-ring is placed in the cavity provided, 
gently roll the o-ring with the fingers to remove any twist that might have occurred during installation. Figure 1261, wipers wipers are used to clean and lubricate the exposed portions of piston shafts. They prevent dirt from entering the system and help protect the piston shaft against scoring. Wipers may be either metallic or felt. They are sometimes used together, a felt wiper installed behind a metallic wiper. Large Aircraft Hydraulic Systems Figure 1262 provides an overview of hydraulic components in large aircraft. Boeing 737 Next Generation Hydraulic System The Boeing 737 Next Generation has three 3,000 pounds per square inch hydraulic systems, System A, System B and Standby. The Standby system is used if System A and or B pressure is lost. The hydraulic systems power the following aircraft systems, flight controls, leading edge flaps and slats, trailing edge flaps, landing gear, wheel brakes, nose wheel steering, thrust reversers, Autopilot's reservoirs The system A, B, and standby reservoirs are located in the wheel well area. The reservoirs are pressurized by bleed air through a pressurization module. The standby reservoir is connected to the system B reservoir for pressurization and servicing. The positive pressure in the reservoir ensures a positive flow of fluid to the pumps. The reservoirs have a standpipe that prevents the loss of all hydraulic fluid if a leak develops in the engine-driven pump or its related lines. The engine-driven pump draws fluid through a standpipe in the reservoir and the AC motor pump draws fluid from the bottom of the reservoir. Figure 1263 Refer to Figure 1264 for the following description. Both A and B hydraulic systems have an engine-driven pump, EDP and an ACMP. The System A engine-driven pump is installed on the number 1 engine and the System B engine-driven pump is installed on the number 2 engine. The AC pumps are controlled by a switch on the flight deck. The hydraulic case drain fluid that lubricates and cools the pumps return to the reservoir through a heat exchanger. Figure 1265, the heat exchanger for the A system is installed in the main fuel tank now. 1, and the heat exchanger for the B system is installed in the main fuel tank now. 2. Minimum fuel for ground operation of electric motor driven pumps is 1,675 pounds in the related main tank. Pressure switches, located in the EDP and ACMP pump output lines, Send signals to illuminate the related low pressure light if pump output the combined pressure of the EDP and ACMP to the related hydraulic system pressure indicator. Filter units filter modules are installed in the pressure, case drain, and return lines to clean the hydraulic fluid. Filters have a differential pressure indicator that pops out when the filter is dirty and needs to be replaced. Power transfer unit, PTU, the purpose of the PTU is to supply the additional volume of hydraulic fluid needed to operate the auto slats and leading edge flaps and slats at the normal rate when system B EDP malfunctions. The PTU unit consists of a hydraulic motor and hydraulic pump that are connected through a shaft. The hydraulic motor of the PTU unit is connected through a shaft with a hydraulic pump that can draw fluid from the system B reservoir. The PTU can only transfer power and cannot transfer fluid. The PTU operates automatically when all of the following conditions are met. System B EDP pressure drops below limits. Aircraft airborne. Flaps are less than 15 degrees but not up. The purpose of the landing gear transfer unit is to supply the volume of hydraulic fluid needed to raise the landing gear at the normal rate when System A EDP is lost. The System B EDP supplies the volume of hydraulic fluid needed to operate the landing gear transfer unit when all of the following conditions are met. Aircraft airborne. No. One engine RPM drops below a limit value. Landing gear lever is up. Either or both main landing gear not up and locked. Standby hydraulic system The standby hydraulic system is provided as a backup if system A and or B pressure is lost. The standby system can be activated manually or automatically and uses a single electric ACMP to power. Thrust reversers, rudder standby yaw damper indications a master caution light illuminates if an overheat or low pressure is detected in the hydraulic system. An overheat light on the flight deck illuminates if an overheat is detected in either system A or B and a low pressure light illuminates if a low pressure is detected in system A and B. Boeing 777 hydraulic system The Boeing 777 is equipped with three hydraulic systems. The left, center, and right systems deliver hydraulic fluid at a rated pressure of 3,000 pounds per square inch, 207 bar, to operate flight controls, flap systems, actuators, landing gear, and brakes. Primary hydraulic power for the left and right systems is provided by two EDPs and supplemented by two on-demand ACMPs. 
Primary hydraulic power for the center system is provided by two electric motor pumps, ACMP, and supplemented by two on demand air turbine driven pumps, ADP. The center system provides hydraulic power for the engine. Flap slash slats. Under emergency conditions, hydraulic power is generated by the ram air turbine, RAT, which is deployed automatically and drives a variable displacement inline pump. The RAT pump provides flow to the center system flight controls. Figure 1266, the left and right hydraulic systems are functionally the same. The left hydraulic system supplies pressurized hydraulic fluid to operate the left thrust reverser and the flight control systems. The right hydraulic system supplies pressurized control systems and the normal brake system. Figure 1267, reservoir the hydraulic system reservoirs of the left and right system contain the hydraulic fluid supply for the hydraulic pumps. The reservoir is pressurized by bleed air through a reservoir pressurization module. The ETP draws fluid through a standpipe. The ACMP draws fluid from the bottom of the reservoir. If the fluid level in the reservoir gets below the standpipe, the ETP cannot draw any fluid any longer, and the ACMP is the only source of hydraulic power. The reservoir can be serviced through a center servicing point in the fuselage of the aircraft. The reservoir has a sample valve for contamination testing purposes, a temperature transmitter for temperature indication on the flight deck, a pressure transducer for reservoir pressure, and a drain valve for reservoir draining. Pumps The EDPs are the primary pumps for the left and right hydraulic systems. The EDPs get reservoir fluid through the EDP supply shutoff valves. The EDPs operates whenever the engines operate. A solenoid valve in each EDP controls the R variable displacement inline piston pumps consisting of a first stage impeller pump and a second stage piston pump. The impeller pump delivers fluid under pressure to the piston pump. The ACMPs are the demand pumps for the left and right hydraulic systems. The ACMPs normally operate only when there is high hydraulic system demand. Filter module pressure and case drain filter modules clean the pressure flows and the case drain flows of the hydraulic pumps. A return filter module cleans the return flow of hydraulic fluid from the user systems. The module can be bypassed if the filter clogs, and a visible indicator pops to indicate a clogged filter. The heat exchanger, which is installed in the wing fuel tanks, cools the hydraulic fluid from ACMP and EDP case drain lines before the fluid goes back to the reservoir. Indication The hydraulic system sensors send pressure, temperature, and quantity signals to the flight deck. A reservoir quantity transmitter and temperature transducer are installed on each of the reservoirs, and a hydraulic reservoir pressure switch is located on the pneumatic line between the reservoir. Pressurization module and the reservoir. The ACMP and EDP filter modules each have a pressure transducer to measure pump output pressure. A temperature transducer is installed in the case drain line of each filter module and measures pump case drain fluid temperature. A system pressure transducer measures hydraulic system pressure. A pressure relief valve on the EDP filter module protects the system against overpressurization. Figure 1267, Center Hydraulic System The center hydraulic system supplies pressurized hydraulic fluid to operate these systems. Figure 1268, Nose Landing Gear Actuation, Nose Landing Gear Steering, Alternate Brakes, Main Landing Gear Actuation, Main Landing Gear Steering, Trailing Edge Flaps, Leading Edge Slat, Flight Controls Reservoir The hydraulic system reservoir of the center system contains the hydraulic fluid supply for the hydraulic pumps. The reservoir is pressurized by bleed air through a reservoir pressurization module. The reservoir supplies fluid to the ADPs, the RAT, and one of the ACMPs through a standpipe. The other ACMP gets fluid from the bottom of the reservoir. The reservoir also supplies hydraulic fluid to the landing gear alternate extension system. The ACMPs are the primary pumps in the center hydraulic system and are normally turned on. The ADPs are the demand pumps in the center system. They normally operate only when the center system needs more hydraulic flow capacity. The RAT system supplies an emergency source of hydraulic power to the center hydraulic system flight controls. A reservoir quantity transmitter and temperature transducer are installed on the reservoir. A hydraulic reservoir pressure switch is installed on the pneumatic line between the reservoir and the reservoir pressurization module. Filter modules clean the pressure and case drain output of the hydraulic pumps. A return filter module cleans the return flow of hydraulic fluid from the user systems. The module can be bypassed. The heat exchanger cools the hydraulic fluid from the ACMP case drains before the fluid goes back to the reservoir. ADP case drain fluid does not go through the heat exchangers. 
The ACMP and ADP filter modules each have a pressure transducer to measure pump output pressure. A temperature transducer in each filter module measures the pump case drain temperature. A system pressure transducer measures hydraulic system pressure. Pressure relief valves in each ADP filter module prevent system overpressurization. A pressure relief valve near ACMP C1 supplies overpressure protection for the Center Hydraulic Isolation System, CHIS. Center Hydraulic Isolation System, CHIS, the CHI supplies engine burst protection and a reserve brakes and steering function. CHI's operation is fully automatic. Relays control the electric motors in the reserve and nose gear isolation valves. When the CHI system is operational, it prevents hydraulic operation of the leading edge slats. System get fluid through a standpipe in the reservoir. This gives ACMP C1 a 1.2 gallon, 4.5 liter, reserve supply of hydraulic fluid. The reserve and nose gear isolation valves are normally open. Both valves close if the quantity in the center system reservoir is low, less than 0.40, and the air speed is more than 60 knots for more than one second. When KAIS is active, this divides the center hydraulic system into different parts. The NLG actuation and steering and the leading edge slat hydraulic lines are isolated from center system pressure. The output of ACMP C1 goes only to the alternate brake system. The output of the other center hydraulic system pumps goes to the trailing edge flaps, the MLG actuation and steering, and the flight controls. If there is a leak in the NLG actuation and steering or less slat lines, there is no further loss of hydraulic fluid. The alternate brakes, the trailing edge flaps, the MLG actuation and steering, and the PFCS continue to operate normally. If there is a leak in the trailing edge flaps, the MLG actuation and steering, or the flight control lines, the reservoir loses fluid down to the standpipe level, 0.00 indication. This causes a loss of these systems, but the alternate brake system continues to get hydraulic power from ACMP C1. If there is a leak in the lines between ACMP C1 and the alternate brake system, all center hydraulic system fluid is lost. Nose gear isolation valve The nose gear isolation valve opens for any of these conditions. Air speed is less than 60 knots. Pump pressures for ACMP C2, ADP C1, ADP C2, and the rat is less than 1,200 pounds per square inch for 30 seconds. Left and right engine RPM is above idle, left and right EDP pressure is more than 2,400 pounds per square inch, and the NLG is not up, the NLG doors are not closed, or the landing gear lever is not up for 30 seconds. The first condition permits the flight crew to operate the NLG steering when airspeed is less than 60 knots, decreased rudder control authority during taxi. The second condition permits operation of the NLG actuation and steering if the hydraulic leak is in the part of the center hydraulic system isolated by the reserve isolation valve. The third condition permits operation of the NLG actuation and steering if there has not been an engine burst and the other hydraulic systems are pressurized. The nose gear isolation valve opens when pressure is necessary at the NLG. If the NLG is not fully retracted or the NLG doors are not closed, the nose gear isolation valve opens to let the NLG complete the retraction. When the landing gear lever is moved to the down position, the nose gear isolation valve opens to let the NLG extend with center system pressure. Central hydraulic system reset both valves open again automatically when the center system quantity is more than 0.70 and airspeed is less than 60 knots for 5 seconds. Both valves also reset when the center system quantity is more than 0.70 and both engines and both engine driven pumps operate normally for 30 seconds. Figure 1269, Aircraft Pneumatic System Some aircraft manufacturers have equipped their aircraft with a high pressure pneumatic system, 3,000 pounds per square inch, in the past. The last aircraft to utilize this type of system was the Fokker F-27. Such systems operate a great deal like hydraulic systems, except they employ air instead of a liquid for transmitting power. Pneumatic systems are sometimes used for brakes, opening and closing doors, driving hydraulic pumps, alternators, starters, water injection pumps, etc. Operating emergency devices Both pneumatic and hydraulic systems are similar units and use confined fluids. The word confined means trapped or completely enclosed. The word fluid implies such liquids as water, oil, or anything that flows. Since both liquids and gases flow, they are considered as fluids, however, there is a great deal of difference in the characteristics of the two. Liquids are practically incompressible, a quart of water still occupies about a quart of space regardless of how hard it is compressed. But gases are highly compressible, 
a quart of air can be compressed into a thimble full of space. In spite of this difference, gases and liquids are both fluids and can be confined and made to transmit power. The type of unit used to high-pressure systems for high-pressure systems, air is usually stored in metal bottles at pressures ranging from 1,000 to 3,000 pounds per square inch, depending on the particular system. Figure 1270, this type of air bottle has two valves, one of which is a charging valve. A ground-operated compressor can be connected to this valve to add air to the bottle. The other valve is a control valve. It acts as a shutoff valve, keeping air trapped inside the bottle until the system is operated. Although the high-pressure storage cylinder is light in weight, it has a definite disadvantage. Since the system cannot be recharged during flight, operation is limited by the small supply of bottled air. Such an arrangement cannot be used for the continuous operation of a system. Instead, the supply of bottled air is reserved for emergency operation of such systems as the landing gear or brakes. The usefulness of this type of system is increased, however, if other air pressurizing units are added to the aircraft. Figure 1271, pneumatic system components Pneumatic systems are often compared to hydraulic systems, but such comparisons can only hold true in general terms. Pneumatic systems do not utilize reservoirs hand pumps. Similarities do exist in some components. Air compressors on some aircraft, permanently installed air compressors have been added to recharge air bottles whenever pressure is used for operating a unit. Several types of compressors are used for this purpose. Some have two stages of compression, while others have three, depending on the maximum desired operating pressure. Relief valves Relief valves are used in pneumatic systems to prevent damage. They act as pressure-limiting units and prevent excessive pressures from bursting lines and blowing out seals. Control valves Control valves are also a necessary part of a typical pneumatic system. Figure 1272 illustrates how a valve is used to control emergency air brakes. The control valve consists of a three-port housing, two poppet valves, and a control lever with two lobes. In figure 1272A, the control valve is shown in the off position. A spring holds the left poppet closed so that brakes. In figure 1272B, the control valve has been placed in the on position. One lobe of the lever holds the left poppet open, and a spring closes the right poppet. Compressed air now flows around the opened left poppet, through a drilled passage, and into a chamber below the right poppet. Since the right poppet is closed, the high-pressure air flows out of the brake port and into the brake line to apply the brakes. To release the brakes, the control valve is returned to the off position. Figure 1272A, the left poppet now closes, stopping the flow of high-pressure air to the brakes. At the same time, the right poppet is opened, allowing compressed air in the brake line to exhaust through the vent port and into the atmosphere. Check valves Check valves are used in both hydraulic and pneumatic systems. Figure 1273 illustrates a flap-type pneumatic check valve. Air enters the left port of the check valve, compresses a light spring, forcing the check valve open and allowing air to flow out the right port. But if air enters from the right, air pressure closes the valve, preventing a flow of air out the left port. Thus, a pneumatic check valve is a one-direction flow control valve. Restrictors Restrictors are a type of control valve used in pneumatic systems. Figure 1274 illustrates an orifice-type restrictor with a large inlet port and a small outlet port. The small outlet port reduces the rate of airflow and the speed of operation of an actuating unit. Variable restrictor Another type of speed-regulating unit is the variable restrictor. Figure 1275, it contains an adjustable needle valve, which has threads around the top and a point on the lower end. Depending on the direction turned, the needle valve moves the sharp point either into or out of a small since air entering the inlet port must pass through this opening before reaching the outlet port. This adjustment also determines the rate of airflow through the restrictor. Filters Pneumatic systems are protected against dirt by means of various types of filters. A micronic filter consists of a housing with two ports, a replaceable cartridge, and a relief valve. Normally, air enters the inlet, circulates around the cellulose cartridge, and flows to the center of the cartridge and out the outlet port. If the cartridge becomes clogged with dirt, pressure forces the relief valve open and allows unfiltered air to flow out the outlet port. A screen-type filter is similar to the Micron filter but contains a permanent wire screen instead of a replaceable cartridge. In the screen filter, a handle extends through the top of the housing and can be used to clean the screen by rotating it against metal scrapers. Desiccant slash moisture separator The moisture separator in a pneumatic system is always located downstream of the compressor. Its purpose is to remove any moisture caused by the compressor. 
A complete moisture separator consists of a reservoir, a pressure switch, a dump valve, and a check valve. It may also include a regulator and a relief valve. The dump valve is energized and de-energized by the pressure switch. When de-energized, it completely purges the separator reservoir and lines up to the compressor. The check valve protects the system against pressure loss during the dumping cycle and prevents reverse flow through the separator. Chemical dryer Chemical dryers are incorporated at various locations in a pneumatic system. Their purpose is to absorb any moisture that may collect in the lines and other parts of the system. Each dryer contains a cartridge that should be blue in color. If otherwise noted, the cartridge is to be considered contaminated with moisture and should be replaced. Emergency backup systems Many aircraft use a high-pressure pneumatic backup source of power to extend the landing gear or actuate the brakes, if the main hydraulic braking system fails. The nitrogen is not directly used to actuate the landing gear actuators or brake units but, instead, it applies the pressurized nitrogen to move hydraulic fluid to the actuator. This process is called neutralics. The following paragraph discusses the components and operation of an emergency pneumatic landing gear extension system used on a business jet. Figure 1276, nitrogen bottles Nitrogen used for emergency landing gear extension is stored in two bottles, one bottle located on each side of the nose will well. Nitrogen from the bottles is released by actuation of an outlet valve. Once depleted, the bottles must be recharged by maintenance personnel. Fully serviced pressure is approximately 3,100 pounds per square inch at 70 degrees Fahrenheit 21 degrees Celsius, enough for only one extension of the landing gear. Gear emergency extension cable and handle The outlet valve is connected to a cable and handle assembly. The handle is located on the side of the co-pilot's console and is labeled Emmer LDG gear. Pulling the handle fully upward opens the outlet valve, releasing compressed nitrogen into the landing gear extension system. Pushing the handle fully downward closes the outlet valve and allows any nitrogen present in the emergency landing gear extension system to be vented overboard. The venting process takes approximately 30 seconds. Dump valve as compressed nitrogen is released to the landing gear selector slash dump valve during emergency extension, the neutralic pressure actuates the dump valve portion of the landing gear selector slash dump valve to isolate the landing gear system from the remainder of hydraulic system. When activated, a blue dump legend is illuminated on the LDG. GR dump V switch, located on the cockpit overhead panel. A dump valve reset switch is used to reset the dump valve after the system has been used and serviced. Emergency extension sequence 1. Landing gear handle is placed in the down position. 2. Red light in the landing gear control handle is illuminated. 3. Emmer LDG gear handle is pulled fully outward. 4. Compressed nitrogen is released to the landing gear selector slash dump valve. 5. Neutralic pressure actuates the dump valve portion of the landing gear selector slash dump valve. 6. Blue dump legend is illuminated on the LDG GR dump switch. 7. Landing gear system is isolated from the remainder of hydraulic system. 8. Neutralic pressure is routed to the open side of the landing gear door actuators, the unlock side of the landing gear uplock actuators, and the extend side of the main landing gear side brace actuators and nose landing gear extend slash retract actuator. 9. Landing gear doors open. 10. Uplock actuators unlock. 11. Landing gear extends down and locks. 12. Three green down and locked lights on the landing gear control panel are illuminated. 13. Landing gear doors remain open. Medium pressure systems A medium pressure pneumatic system, 50 to 150 pounds per square inch, usually does not include an air bottle. Instead, it generally draws air from the compressor section of a turbine engine. This process is often called bleed air and is used to provide pneumatic power for engine starts, engine deicing, wing deicing, and in some cases, it provides hydraulic power to the aircraft systems, if the hydraulic system is equipped with an air-driven hydraulic pump. Engine bleed air is also used to pressurize the reservoirs of the hydraulic system. Bleed air systems are discussed in more detail in the power plant handbook. Low pressure systems Many aircraft equipped with reciprocating engines obtain a supply of low pressure air from vane type pumps. These pumps are driven by electric motors or by the aircraft engine. Figure 1277 shows a schematic view of one of these pumps, which consists of a housing with two ports, a drive shaft, and two vanes. The drive shaft and the vanes contain slots, so the shaft is eccentrically mounted in the housing, 
causing the veins to form four different sizes of chambers, A, B, C, and D. In the position shown, B is the largest chamber and is connected to the supply port. As depicted in figure 1277, outside air can enter chamber B of the pump. When the pump begins to operate, the drive shaft rotates and changes positions of the veins and sizes of the chambers. Vein no. One then moves to the right, separating chamber B from the supply port. Chamber B now contains trapped air. As the shaft continues to turn, chamber B moves downward and becomes increasingly smaller, gradually compressing its air. Near the bottom of the pump, chamber B connects to the pressure port and sends compressed air into the pressure line. Then chamber B moves upward again becoming increasingly larger in area. At the supply port, it receives another supply of air. There are four such chambers in this pump and each goes through this same cycle of operation. Thus, the pump delivers to the pneumatic system a continuous supply of compressed air from 1 to 10 pounds per square inch. Low pressure systems are used for wing deasing boot systems. Pneumatic power system maintenance Maintenance of the pneumatic power system consists of servicing, troubleshooting, removal, and installation of components, and operational testing. The air compressor's lubricating oil level should be checked daily in accordance with the applicable manufacturer's instructions. The oil level is indicated by means of a sight gauge or dipstick. When refilling the compressor oil tank, the oil, type specified in the applicable instructions manual, is added until the specified level. After the oil is added, ensure that the filler plug is torqued, and safety wire is properly installed. The pneumatic system should be purged periodically to remove the contamination, moisture, or oil from the components and lines. Purging the system is accomplished by pressurizing it and removing the plumbing from various components throughout the system. Removal of the pressurized lines causes a high rate of airflow through the system, causing foreign matter to be exhausted from the system. If an excessive amount of foreign matter, particularly oil, is exhausted from any one system, the lines and components should be removed and cleaned or replaced. Upon completion of pneumatic system purging and after reconnecting all the system components, the system air bottles should be drained to exhaust any moisture or impurities that may have accumulated there. After draining the air bottles, service the system with nitrogen or clean, dry compressed air. The system should then be given a thorough operational check and an inspection for leaks and security.